11 years ago when I first started growing carnivorous plants I really wanted to see these guys in the wild and the one place in the world that I really wanted to see them was Australia because Australia has the most different carnivorous plants that you can find on any continent. Seeing as I now live in Australia, I can actually go find them in the wild. So a couple of weeks ago, I sent out a message on our carnivorous plants group asking if anyone knows where I can find these plants and one person replied to me. His name is Peter and he's actually an ecologist so obviously he'll know some of the really good spots to find some of these plants. So we set up a date and we went to Malula River National, I can't speak, National Park. We're going to look for some different Drosera and Utricularia. And we're here with Peter and Courtney, which you've seen before. And we're going to find lots of different plants here. He's obviously been here many times before. We were just looking for some Utricularia back there, but we didn't find anything. So this was a very nice park here. So let's go see what we can find. So as you guys can see, Malula River National Park is actually very, very pretty. Because it is a national park, it is actually protected, so people can't go in there and destroy it and cut it down. Which means that obviously all of the natural life there is pretty much pristine. At the beginning of the trail, we actually went to go and look for Utricularia biloba, which is one of the most pretty carnivorous plants that you can find. It is a type of Utricularia which catches microscopic organisms under the surface of the ground. Now, we went to a patch just before the start of the trail to find this plant, but we didn't end up finding Utricularia, but we did end up finding the sensitive plant. They actually close their leaves whenever you touch them. If you touch the leaves, they close up and they fall down, which is a very, very interesting adaptation that they have made. So we're just walking and I noticed this flower over here and I noticed that this was one of those sensitive plants and I was like, no way. So I just touched the leaves and it is. Wow, oh, that's crazy. Now seeing as Peter is an ecologist, he obviously knew what to look for and he actually said to me he wants to see how long it will take for me to notice the first carnivorous plant. Now there's actually quite a few different things that you need to actually look out for when you're in an area which is good for carnivorous plants to actually grow in. And right away Peter shows off his experience in growing these plants and looking for the type of habitats they need right off the bat and admittedly it actually took me quite a while to find the first plants and if it weren't for him pointing them out to me, I actually wouldn't have noticed them at all. So we were walking for like, there's the entrance right down there. And Peter said that he, he will see how long it takes me to find a plant. And I haven't seen one yet. And he says, yeah, you've actually missed quite a few already. And he just points right here. And here we have Drosera spatulata. It is spatulata, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Cool. Yes, spatulata at the base of a tree. Of course, it's only one, but he Here's says the there's much more down there. Here's some more here. Oh wow. Yeah, you can see there's some more there as well. Aww. And another one. Mm -hmm. So now that there. you start to get your eye tuned in, you'll really start to see more. Yeah. Uh, but you can see that in terms of where they grow, this is a very common sort of thing there. You'll see the ground's dark, yeah. wet, it's moist. Um, and that's a very good sign that uh, you're going to start to find sundew. So as you can see, that probably about 20 metres up, you'll see it was a lot drier. There wasn't this um, sort of wetter mm. sort of soil. Yeah. Um, so the second that started, pretty much um, there was a couple plants straight away. So. Okay. That's very cool. Here's a good one here. Look at this one here. Oh, that's a nice one, eh? I'm starting to flower, it looks like. Yeah. That's just a leaf. No, that's a red. Yeah. That red one's a flower coming up. You can actually see them up against the grass. And they're all flowering as well now. You can see back there they weren't really flowering, but now there's so a, a little, little bit more sun. Yeah. Yeah. More flowers down there. It's nice. Mm. And as Peter was saying, they like to grow under the trees here. You can see they're, they're like kind of everywhere now. They like to grow under the trees, and in this area, they, when they dry out they die back and they come back from seed. But Peter was saying that when you get down towards the more wet areas and they are much bigger and they last for much longer. Uh, so these are basically fire trails. Okay. Um, yeah, there was actually a really bad fire that went through here about um, 
I'm going to say maybe two years ago. Okay. And may still, uh, yeah, well, you can actually see there. Now, if you have a look at the paper bark, you still see it's got a bit of the black, yeah. black thing on it. So this entire park nearly burnt. Wow. Um, some sections more than others. It was quite spectacular watching it from a distance. Um, uh, and it wasn't the most original fires from Perigian. This was actually a different fire back a few years ago. Okay. Um, but you'll see that the Australian bush, and a lot of people complain about, you know, our oh, fires are bad, but I think it's about intensity. So mm. you'll see mm. that if there's a really intense fire, um, if you go up to Perigian where it was really intense, you'll actually see a lot of the trees up there actually died. That's how yeah. bad it was. So that was a really bad fire. Whereas here, you look around and it looks like normal, yeah. but you can see the scars of fire, you know, you can see yeah. the, the blackening of the bark here. You can see that this was burning in here and the fire in here wasn't as intense and the Australian um, is designed for fire. So yeah. it actually helps to kill back um, plant loads. You'll see then different plants come up and succeed. Seeds, a lot of the seeds are driven on heat of the fire. Mm. So your banks here, here's the banks that I was talking about before. So those, those plants there, they will not, those seeds, um, a lot of those may not actually um, flower until they've actually been, had the heat and the smoke yeah. the combination, one or both or uh, one or the other, they will actually allow the seeds to germinate. Yeah. So fire is really important in Australia, mm. you know, that's why the Aboriginals um, are so keen on actually managing with fire, that's what they used to do because when the plants used to grow back, that's when they used to be able to then come in and animals would come in and they could hunt the animals, but yeah. they used to manage that really well. Oh, that's good. So after Peter had given us that really interesting information about the connection that Aboriginal people have with the fires in the land, he then pointed out that the ground that we were walking on had actually changed a bit. And of course, I didn't actually realize this. He noticed that the ground started to become much more sandy than where we previously were. And if you know anything about different types of sun dews, Australia is actually home to tuber sun dews. And these guys need both very sandy soils and they need fire to really help them grow in and amongst all the different vegetation in the area. Couple plants just there again. So we'll have a look, but maybe we may see them. So up along these banks, there are Joshua Lenata. Um, oh, nice. So if they're not up, um, then they'll be down in their tuberous state. Yeah. Peter was pointing out how the sand, you can notice really how white it is there. And where we just came from, how it was, was much less sandy, but this is like very, very fine sand. Kind of reminds me of the sand that we saw on Table Mountain or kind of similar to almost like beach sand. Would you say beach sand? Absolutely, because you've got a lot of beaches up through here. Mm. Um, you've got Fraser Island, uh, Morton Island, uh, Stradbroke Island, three massive sand um, islands um, on, the, um, on the east coast of Australia. So yeah. this is all part of that makeup you'll, you'll see, so. So do you think that the sand gets you through wind? What do you think was here from before? Oh, no, I think there's a combination of different things. You know, sand's been deposited here from, you know, uh, you know, many years of, you know, floods and rains, um, you know, sand being pushed in through. Um, so these are all low-lying low areas as well too. So there's definitely, and there's a lot of big sand stretch um, veins through here as well. So there's a big one running up through to Dillabar. Uh, a lot of people might've heard of a sand mine that was gonna go in there. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just a very common um, soil type up in this region. Okay. So shortly after that, we encountered our first traces of tuberous drosera lunata, but there was something very strange going on here. If you know anything about tuberous drosera, you know that they obviously first need very sandy soils, which I've already spoken about, but they also grow in winter. That means that during summertime, when it is very hot, as it is right now, it's the middle of summer, these guys form their tubers underground and they go to sleep, which is where they get the name tuberous drosera. But as you guys would see, they're currently growing right now, which is extremely unusual for any and all tuberous droseras. So that's one thing that's really unique about this area is that and even um, Alan uh, Laurie noted in his books that uh, the populations here seem to not necessarily follow the seasons, but yeah. actually... Um, Drosera lunata. Tuberous drosera growing in very sandy soils. I'm thinking to myself, it's the middle of summer. Yes, exactly. It's weird. So there you go, that's that one. So you've got two species now. Yeah. 
and there's still some spatulata you'll see them every now and then but it doesn't look like there's as much as what there was earlier but once again very very sandy soils and i'm in i'm in gum boots for when you get to the wet areas and there's another one there coming up. Look at that, that's brand new. Look yeah. at that. Oh, look at this one here. Look at this, that's cool. Oh, that one's old, eh? Yeah, look at this one here. That one there is quite. We were just noticing how all of these tubers, all of their growth is fairly new, which is quite strange because if you guys know, there's another one here coming up. Look at it, just brand spanking new. If you oh, know look at this. Look at this one. This one here's got a very strong tuber yeah. system underneath. Look at that, that's three coming up so that would be a quite an established plant that one there yeah it's quite strange that they're coming up in the middle of summer but these were saying it's probably because they know that there's enough moisture in the soil which is fairly damp there's enough moisture for them to actually grow and come up and Here's be able to nice survive here look at these couple just here yeah look at that look at that that's amazing That's great. A large tuber underground that that's come from, and there's another one just there yeah. that's popped up. So look at that one there, like that, that yeah, there. Huge. That there is very, very well established, that one there. Especially for, um, we're in January. Yeah, January 21. Quite look, a big there's one. another one there, look at that. Yeah. These guys are much bigger. In the shade. Yeah, a little bit of shade, not as much red color. What is this? Strength in that, that is amazing. Look at this. Yeah. So we got some lunata and some spatulata literally right next to each other, like a couple centimeters away. And here's a nice big one. Yeah. We're, we're seeing these these Joshua Leonatas now everywhere. We haven't really seen many um, Joshua Spatulata for a while, but now we're seeing some. That looks good. We really haven't gone that far. Looks like there's a little little bit of water over there. Yeah. Little lake or something. Uh, so it's part of the Malua um uh, catchment through here. Okay. Uh. Now, as you guys just saw, we came across a little bit of a natural lake which is holding quite a bit of water. Now, if you know anything about Utricularia, you know that they really like to have a lot of water, and that is where you most oftentimes find them, especially because that Utricularia biloba that I spoke of earlier is rumored to be in this area. So, every little wet patch that we came across and we found, we made sure to look at and check if we could find this Utricularia biloba, but unfortunately we didn't find any in this spot here. Now at this point in the walk, we honestly had not gotten far at all, but we had spent at least 30 minutes looking at the different plants that we've seen so far, namely Drosera spatulata and Drosera lunata. But as we crossed this little stream here, this was when we were told that we could expect to find almost all of the different carnivorous plants that we were expecting to find on this journey. And the first one that we were starting to look out for was Drostra binata, otherwise known as the forked leaf sundew. Now the thing about these guys is that unlike Drostra spatulata and Lunata that we have seen so far, where they're growing out in the middle of the fire trail, Drostra binata actually grows up and in between the grasses, which is quite strange because you would expect them to be growing out in the open like the other two. You're gonna to start to see Joshua uh, Binata. Yeah. Uh, they love these little wet areas like this. Um, but what you'll see, they see them off into, um, into the scrub. You occasionally see them right next to the path. Uh, they're flowering at the moment, um, I'm hoping. So really nice big white flowers. Yeah. There we go. So, more Lunata. If you keep working way up there, you'll see them all up along this bank. Yeah. Uh, you'll start to see some reticular area. I'm 100% sure this is where they started last time I was here. So. 
So that is it for part one of this video series. Make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss out on our second part. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, please remember to leave a like, it really helps out the channel. Now, if you are looking for Drosro Spatulata or Drosro Capensis plants, or you are looking for some other tuberous Drosro, make sure that you email me because I am selling them. I'm also selling different pots and I'm selling soil that you might want for your plants. So do let me know, I am selling them. But other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video series and I'll see you in the next one, which I'm gonna start editing right now. Bye guys.